Hi everyone, welcome to the Wise Folks Almanac. And today we have a special guest with us, William Green. And I'm here with my co-host Sabir Ahmed. Let me introduce William Green to all of you and I've prepared a note for William Green. So I'm gonna read it out right now. William Green is a renowned author and interviewer known for his best-selling book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, which has received high praise from Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner at Berkshire Hathaway, as one of the best books on investing ever written. William collaborated on several books that became bestsellers in both the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and worked closely with hedge fund manager Guy Spear to write his well-received memoir, The Education of a Value Investor. William has also conducted in-depth interviews with some of the world's most successful investors, including Charlie Munger, Sir John Templeton, Howard Marks, and Joel Greenblatt, exploring their habits and insights that have contributed to their enduring success. A Berkshire Hathaway AGM attendee and believer in the value investing philosophy, William was born and raised in London, received his education at Eton College, studied English literature at Oxford University, and earned a master's degree from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. William, it's our great pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you. My resume always sounds much more impressive than the reality, so we should probably stop right now <laughs> William, that's your humbleness, obviously. But before I go to the questions that we've prepared for you, I'd just briefly like to introduce your book. So this is the first book, uh, if all of you can see, Richer, Wiser, Happier. This is the latest best-selling that William has written. I'm going to show you, all of you, another book that is a piece of art. Literally, it's a piece of art. Uh, hopefully, you, all of you can see this. The Great Minds of Investing. It's a really, really nice book. Uh, William, you, you got to tell us, you know, uh, right after the show, how did you come up with, you know, this design uh, of this book specifically? It's so beautiful. And, uh, you know, I would really urge audience to go and grab and just take the feeling of it. You know, it's, yeah, it's that's a beautiful book. And I, I wish I could take some credit for it, but it's actually, it's designed by a guy called DJ Stout, who's a, a hmm. famous designer living in Texas. And he works for a firm called Pentagram, which is a legendary firm. They would redesign all of the major magazines in America. And huh. Pentagram, as I remember, has offices in, you know, New York, London, Paris, and Austin, Texas. And the reason they have an office in Austin, Texas is because <laughs> DJ Stout is there because he's just extraordinary. <laughs> and he, um, and he, he, he had a retrospective book a few years ago uh, of his career because he's such an important designer that was called um, Variations on a Rectangle, which is such a beautiful title. And so he's an extraordinary designer. And, it, and so it was a collaboration with him and a guy called Michael O'Brien, who's an extraordinary photographer, who's a great portrait photographer. And so if you look at the cover of Roger Lowenstein's book on Warren Buffett, there's yeah. a famous picture of Buffett looking kind of like a little pissed off, you know, with his arms sort of folded <laughs> against a gray sky standing on a roof. And that, that photo is taken by Michael O'Brien and is in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian Museum. And mm. so I got involved in that book because Michael O'Brien and um, uh, and DJ Stout had been working with this um, European money manager, a guy called Henrik Leber, um, who had hired them to work on this project for years. And then I came in sort of at the end over the last year, basically, to write profiles to go with Michael's extraordinary photographs. So it's kind of it's kind of a collector's item, the the book. Because, so it costs seventy five dollars, and they've never discounted it, and they never intended to to make a profit off it. Um, and it's just a beautiful object. And so in some ways, when I, so, so I got to interview about 22 famous investors for that book. And I, then I edited profiles of another 11. And then part of what happened with my book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, which I regard sort of, a, you know, as my sort of magnum opus, because I spent five years working on it without taking a vacation or a Sunday off, practically. Um, I, I thought, okay, so I've met some of these absolutely extraordinary people for the great minds of investing. Who would I want to spend an enormous amount of time with? Uh, and then I added interviews that I'd done over the last 25 years with people like Jack Bogle, the founder of 
of Vanguard, which manages something like seven trillion dollars, or Peter Lynch, the legendary manager from Fidelity, um, all of these really legendary managers that I that I'd interviewed over twenty five years. And then I would go off and I would say, okay, so someone like Monish Pabrai, who I've known for many years, who I interviewed for um, the Great Minds of Investing as well, I was like, wouldn't it be kind of cool if I could go to India with Monish? And so I'd go off for five days traveling across India with Monish, and we would share, you know, a, a bunk bed on an all night train um, from Kota to Mumbai. And so we were just doing these, you know, it gave me this incredible opportunity to take some of what I'd learned that I'd done in these sort of short profiles in the great minds of investing and go big on them in, in richer, wiser, happier. So in, in some ways, richer, wiser, happier is sort of the greatest hits of, of my, my, my 25 years or so of interviewing famous investors. Cause I was trying to think who are the most extraordinary people I've met mm. and, and what yeah. are the most important lessons um, that I can share from them. And so I, I would go off, you know, I wrote a profile of, of um, Arnold Vandenberg for um, The Great Minds of Investing, but it was only 800 words. And so I went to Austin and I spent two and a half days with Arnold for Richer, Wiser, Happier. And I, I even got um, hypnotized by him lying on the floor of his office. So, so in some ways, the relationship between those two books is an interesting one because, you know, the great minds of investing, I, I, I regard as an object of beauty because of because of Michael O'Brien and DJ Stout. I can't take any credit at all for that. Um, but the profiles, the profiles are short snapshots of um, these extraordinary characters. But what's really remarkable is to look at Michael's photos and and you're looking at people like Charlie Munger from this close to them. And so you're looking in Munger's eyes, in Buffett's eyes, and he wouldn't let them smile. And so it's just this sort of raw portrait where you look at mm -hmm. the intelligence in their eyes and the skepticism and the wariness and the wisdom. They're very, they're very, very interesting portraits. So, so, so yeah, I wish I could claim more, uh, more of an important role, but really, really, I, uh, the, the, the glory goes to the incredible DJ Stout and Michael O'Brien. And I'm not just being modest there, but those guys are utterly remarkable. And I'll, I'll mention one more thing before I let you get on with your questions that you actually wanted to ask, which is that um, Michael O'Brien did a book with the musician, Tom Waits. And, and so Michael did these incredible photographs of homeless people in Texas. And Tom Waits, who's an incredible musician, wrote poems that went with it. And so I've often said to Michael that I regard myself as the Tom Waits of the financial world because I'm his collaborator on a book about investing. So that must make me the Tom Waits of the the uh, the <laughs> investing world. That's that's obviously true, uh, William. And <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we obviously would like to uh, go into more details about that. Let me show uh, the uh, education of value investor. This book. Uh, which is written by Guy Spear, which you helped him write extensively yeah. over the years. So, um, you know, this is, this is one of the books uh, that William helped Guy Spear write. And this was, uh, you know, uh, I think I think this was a bestseller as well. So I don't know. And it's, know, a, it's a beautiful book. I would, I, yes. I would encourage our, our viewers to read it because what's unusual about Guy's book <laughs> is that he's honest and... If Absolutely. you think of most people in the investment world, there's so much pressure to market and to sell and to, yes. to put yourself in the best possible light. And Guy comes out and decides that he's going to tell the truth about himself. And there was, a, there was an extraordinary day where we were working together on his book in Zurich in his home in, in Switzerland. And we were kind of excited about how it was going. And we walked into his kitchen to make cappuccino because he has an incredible cappuccino machine that he'd imported specially and uh, he he'd got a barista to come and train him to use this uh uh this incredible um uh, la mazocco machine and um and he said to me um i i don't care if this book ruins my reputation i just want to give an honest accounting of who i am and that's a very profound message because you know, when I when I started working on that book, I thought, well, I'll make a bit of money and I'll spend time with my friend Guy and it'll be interesting. And once he started to say, no, I'm just going to tell the truth. 
I'm going to give an honest accounting of who I am, including all of my mistakes, the things I've learned from. Then I started to get excited. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a really important lesson in that, which is that when you see people like Guy Spear and his very close friend, Monish Pabrai, deciding that they're just going to tell the truth, it, it puts you in a whole different space because you start to think, oh, wait a second, they're not spinning me. They're not trying to sell anything to me. They're actually trying to tell the truth. And, and that's a very powerful lesson for our listeners or viewers, because of, of all of the things you want to, that you want to clone, that you want to replicate, that you want to mimic from the greatest investors, this is one of the most powerful. The, the fact that Monish and Guy just decided, we're just going to tell the truth. That puts them in a whole different category. And so Monish has been more or less adopted as a, as a mentee and friend by Charlie Munger, Buffett's mm -hmm. partner for all of these years. And why do you think that is? It's because he tells the truth. That's a very powerful, it's a very powerful thing. And so, so Guy's book and being in his orbit and working on that book was a, was a powerful lesson for me. That, that, that set me on an interesting path of thinking, okay, maybe I should try to be a little more truthful or maybe even a lot more truthful. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, William. Uh, you know, uh, these are these are just gems, and uh, I really appreciate you sharing all these details about the, those books. Uh, now, William, going to the questions that we've prepared for you, uh, my first question to you, William, is that you have conducted extensive interviews with some of the greatest investment minds over the last two decades and have developed the ability to recognize patterns that distinguish average investors from legendary ones. You've also spoken with aspiring fund managers who have been inspired by figures like Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, and others from the Graham and Dodgeville School of Thought. What, in your opinion, William, do these young aspiring fund managers often miss that you clearly see the legendary investors have in common? There are so many things that the legendary investors have in common, one of which is that they, they tend to have a lack of emotion. They tend not to be hugely emotional. But I'll, I'll, I'll focus on another thing, which I think is really important, which is that, that Munger often explains that investing is simple not easy. And I think one of the things that, that young money managers, but also all of the rest of us miss is just how hard this game is. There's a tendency, I, there's a tendency to, to read magazines or books and think, oh yeah, this is easy. I can, I can make a fortune. You know, if I roll the dice on cryptocurrencies and, uh, you know, I can make 30% in a day or a week or something, or uh, yes, I'm entitled to make 400% in a year on Bitcoin or something. And, you know, or yes, I can buy a, a tech stock like Tesla and it's going to go up 400% in a year. And I think as we've seen recently with the, the, the meltdown in things like Tesla, which I think is down about 70% or, or Bitcoin, which is what, down 60, 70% or, or, you know, FTX, which has done a little bit worse than 60, 70% down. It's a reminder this is a difficult game and you need to be vigilant. You need to do the work. And so this is, this is kind of an important lesson, right? Is that you, you have to, you have to decide going in as an investor, do I actually have what it takes to win this game? I mean, do, do I have, for example, the lack of emotion, the, the emotional equanimity so that when things go wrong, when your stock halves, you look at your stock with dispassion. You say, well, yeah, but I know the valuation. I know it's cheap and I'm okay holding it. Or will you absolutely fall apart? Do you have the financial skills, the technical skills actually to sit down and analyze the stock? So there's a, there's a legendary investor called Joel Greenblatt who famously made 40% a year for 20 years, which is just absolutely unheard of, right? And Greenblatt said to me, um, most people simply shouldn't be investing their own money. They're not qualified. And he said, if you don't know how to analyze a stock and value a business, on what possible basis should you be doing this? It's not, it's not like you, you know, you would do your own surgery. If you, if you, if you had a cataract, 
effect on your eye. You wouldn't say, yeah, I, I think I could probably do this. And, and you'd, you'd, sort of, you'd sort of say, yeah, let me watch a video on YouTube and I'll read, I'll read a book. And yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. And yet people take their life savings or their kids' college accounts or their, um, their parents' retirement accounts. They say, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. And so I think, the, I, I, I think the first thing is to take stock and be a little honest with ourselves and say, yeah, this is, this is a game that is relatively simple, right? The rules of the game are not that complicated. The, the, the laws of financial gravity have been laid out by people like Buffett, Munger, Joe Greenblatt, Howard Marks. You can see them throughout my book from my interviews with people like that. Uh, you can see it if you read Joe Greenblatt's books. You can see it if you read Howard Marks' books. Uh, you can see some of them from Guy's book. The, the rules of the game are not that complicated. Executing them is really hard. And and so I think the first thing for 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 any fund manager or any individual investor, you gotta you gotta start by saying, let me learn the rules of the game. What are the rules of the game? So th so this is key. So just to give you an example of this, one of the most fundamental rules of the game that Joe Greenblatt explained to me is value a business and then buy it for less than it's worth, right? And this sounds super simple. It's very easy to have your eyes glaze over when you hear this. But A, it's difficult to value a business and you, you need the skills to do that. Um, and, and so you have, to, you have to, you know, do a little bit of a, a, accounting training. I mean, you, you did this, Ryan, right? You, you're a CPA, right? So, so you, need that, you need that financial literacy, which I don't have. Um, and I'm not that interested in it. I have other types of literacy, not that type. Um, so I have to be honest with myself and say, well, I'm not really qualified for that. So I shouldn't be picking individual stocks, although I do occasionally just because I have lapses in judgment and common sense. But so, so that's the first thing. So, so figure out um, the, the laws of investing, figure out the skills that you need, um, the technical skills figure out whether you have the intensity, the appetite, the passion for this. So, so one of the common traits that I see when I look at the greatest investors, they're not just unemotional and dispassionate and rational. These are intense people. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a famous investor called Will Danoff of Fidelity who manages over $200 billion, has an incredible record over, over the best part of 30 years, right? And um, Bill Miller, who's a, another incredible investor, right? Who, who beat the market famously for 15 years, um, which is unheard of, was telling me that when he first met Will Danoff, I think they were at an investment, uh, an, some sort of investment event um, in Phoenix, Arizona. This is about 30 years ago. And they're both really likable people, right? Um, like, very, uh, and they're good friends these days. And Bill Miller said to me, when he was introduced to Will Danoff, uh, Bill held out his hands and he said, uh, hi, Will, pleased to meet you. I'm Bill. And Will Danoff didn't hold out his hand and just said, I'm going to beat you, man. I'm going to beat you. That's really revealing that kind of intensity of someone, so, someone who's so driven that he's just like, yeah, I'm going to win this game. And so, so to succeed as a, as a, as a top performer in anything, you got to have the skills, you got to have the knowledge, you got to have the temperament, and you got to have the passion, you got to have the intensity, you got to care. So Will, Will Danoff said to me at one point, frankly, I care more. And he, you know, this is a guy who just keeps turning over more and more rocks to look for cheap stocks, for undervalued stocks. And so his mentor was Peter Lynch. And Peter Lynch said, look, if, if, you, if you analyze 10 stocks, chances are you might find one good one. If you analyze 20, maybe you'll find two good ones. And so, so Lynch was like, it's just a matter of, you know, how many rocks do you turn over? And so Lynch would, would carpool at something like 6.30 in the morning um, so that he could read analyst reports in the car while he was, while he was going to the office. Um, then he would work at the weekends. And he was like, look, there are so many smart people in this business. The only, the only way you can win is to outwork them. So, so at this point, some of our listeners are going, oh, damn, so I shouldn't be playing this game at all. And, and that's okay, too. 
because there's an incredible default position here, right? There are a couple of default positions. One is, how is someone really good? That's difficult, right? Because analyzing people and fi finding good fund managers, as you know, that's a difficult task in its own right, but not impossible. And that's, that's largely what I've done. So I've invested in about, um, I guess, three funds that are actively managed by other people. And then the other thing you can do, which is possibly even smarter, is just to index, just to buy a tracker fund, an index fund, and just say, look, the market is pretty efficient. On the whole, it prices stocks pretty accurately. As we can see from this recent period, it doesn't price stocks that accurately. Like often there are periods where things are too expensive or too cheap. But, you know, it's difficult to beat the index. And so one of the things that I've done as a hedge over the years, for more than 20 years, is I own a, a Vanguard International Index Fund and a, and a Vanguard US Total Stock Market Index Fund. And I would just keep adding to them. And so, uh, so for my wife's money and my kids' money, that's what I would do traditionally because I'm, I, I don't feel like they should pay for my delusion that I can beat the market. Like maybe I can, maybe the funds that I've picked will beat the market, but I, you know, I, I want to hedge against my own hubris and arrogance and say, no, maybe I'll just be able to get the market return. That's what most of us can do. So, so, so I'm sorry for this long winded answer, but I, I hope there are a few things that become clear. First, first figure out whether you have the desire and the skills to win this game, um, have that self knowledge. Second, figure out what the rules of the game are, like study what people like Buffett have taught. And, and these rules are not complex. Like, like you want to buy stocks at a discount to what they're worth. That's one of the, the, one of the, the, the great fundamental laws of investing. There are, there are other ways to make money as well. I mean, there are lots of different ways to climb this mountain, but this is one of the most durable and reliable over decades is to say, let me, let me buy something for less than it's worth for less than its intrinsic value. And then there's this magical thing that happens, which is that over some period of time, which is unpredictable and random, the, the intrinsic value and the stock price true up, they converge. And nobody knows how long it's going to happen. I mean, Joe Greenblatt thinks it usually takes two or three years. Sometimes you can go much longer than that. But, but understanding that there's this fundamental law of financial gravity that, that in, the, in the long run, the stock price will reflect the intrinsic value. That's really powerful. And, and so I, I had an interview recently, it's coming out on my podcast, I think this, this Saturday night, um, with an extraordinary investor called Fred Martin. And he said, look, there are two sources of profit with a stock. There's, there's that closing of the gap between intrinsic value and the stock price, the truing up, as he puts it, and there's the growth in intrinsic value. So if you can find a, a stock that's relatively good value and you can say, well, the intrinsic value is gonna, gonna grow, its profits are gonna grow, its cash flow is gonna increase, and you can buy at a good price, you'll, you'll benefit on both fronts from that, that closing of the gap between value and price and the increase in, in intrinsic value. So, so that's, a, that's a really important fundamental law that we need to understand. And most people don't even get to that stage of understanding those financial laws of, of investing. Um, so you've got to understand those. You've got to put in the effort. Um, but then you, then you need these other things, the, the temperament, the intensity, the drive, the discipline. As, as one of the investors I wrote about in my book, Paul Lancer said, you, you don't get to be Roger Federer without playing a lot of tennis. You, you gotta have drive. I hope that's helpful despite how long-winded it, it, it was. Oh, your insights are much appreciated, William. And, uh, you know, um, so uh, I'd obviously like to go into, you know, more details about this, but, uh, you know, we, we have prepared a few more questions. So I'll just get, sure. go to the next one. Okay, sure, um, sure, sure. William, I have always been fascinated by Monish Pabrai, uh, one yeah. of the greatest investors of our time, uh, not only because of his ability to clone the best ideas of others, but also of his perspective on the world 
as a series of games with odds of winning and losing. For the chapter on Monish in your book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, uh, and you just mentioned about it, you literally traveled with him across India for an extended period and had the opportunity to observe him up close. An opportunity I envy. You wrote in your book, and I quote, along the way, I've come to appreciate the tremendous power of his method of reverse engineering, replicating, and often improving on other people's successful strategies. Given what you are able and willing to disclose, William, could you recall some of those events or conversation with Monish or share any interactions that you think are worth mentioning that didn't make into this book? This would be especially helpful for those who may not have the opportunity to be around Monish and observe what he does. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of insights into Monish that have come up. I'll have to try to remember which the second one was that have come up since the book came out. So the first one is Monish very kindly decided he was going to buy a lot of copies of the book and gift them. Like one of the things that Monish and Guy do is they gift thousands of books a year to people. Um, and in a way, it's a beautiful example of, of this idea of compounding goodwill, of, of, of doing kind acts to people, uh, and then sort of trusting that the universe is going to be kind back to you. And, and so Monish decided he was going to gift lots of copies of my book. And, um, and I had a, a publicist at the time who was arranging for a bulk purchase of the book for Monish and he was going to buy it in India and he was going to buy it in the U S and, and, and I'm looking at the quote that they come up with and the publicist has, you know, there are a few companies that specialize in bulk, bulk buys of books. And because in, and at Amazon, I think you can buy a few, but if you wanted to buy say a hundred copies or 50 copies or a thousand copies or whatever, you, you go to a bulk um, order place. And I'm looking at this and and Monish says to me, you know, this is the quote that they got. Is this a, is this a good price? And I look at it and I'm like, no, not really. It's like, I can see that there's this other company that does bulk orders that could do it cheaper. And so one of the things that Monish has talked about that I write about in that chapter is the importance of being truthful. So I write to Monish and I say, um, yeah, you're being charged more here. And I think what's going on is that the bulk purchase is going through a particular company that's going to be counted. Th these sales are going to be counted in the bestseller list. And so I think what my promoter, what my publicist is doing is trying to route this order through a company that's going to benefit me. And as a result, you're not getting the best price. And so it was maybe difference of a dollar a book or something like that, or a dollar fifty or something. And so I just explained this sort of thinking, well, it's against my interest, right? Because like it would be good for these sales to be counted to the best sell list. But I tell him the truth. And Monish writes back immediately and says, uh, no problem, William, I'll do it through the uh, company that they suggest. So Monish immediately decides to take a hit of I'm guessing it was thousands of dollars by going through the more expensive company that's going to benefit me. It's a really interesting exchange on multiple fronts that instead of trying to, instead of me trying to cheat him or, or, or just serve my best interests, I looked out for his best interests and he then looked out for my best interests and did something knowingly that didn't serve him well, that served me better than him. That's a very, that's a very thought provoking exchange that gives you a sense of the person. Right. And, and I think that, I think that raises some really interesting questions about how you want to operate your life. Like that, that there's, there's this terrifying, huh. there's this terrifying moment where you think, what if I'm really honest and open and people just exploit me and take advantage of me because I seem like a sucker. And the gamble that Monish has taken is that if you behave honestly and honorably, the universe will reflect that back to you. And that's really interesting. And for me to see that in action through that exchange was really, really interesting and really telling. 
And so when you see people actually behave in ways that match the way they talk, that's very revealing. Uh, and so, so that was very interesting to me. And the second thing I'll mention is when I, when I went to, um, when I went to Omaha last time, Monish has a, uh, so we, we tend to go, I, I skipped it for a few years, but I, I went um, again last year to the annual general meeting for Berkshire in Omaha. And Monish has this lovely dinner uh, in a really nice steakhouse the, the so Saturday night after, um, after Warren and Charlie talk for about five hours answering questions. And, um, and he takes out this beautiful restaurant with Ajit Jain's son. Ajit Jain is the guy who runs the insurance business for Berkshire Hathaway. And so I'm sitting there in this restaurant. I, I, I don't know, maybe there were 70 people or something. Gus Spear comes, all these really good investors. And, um, and I, I was flattered and lucky enough to be sitting on the table with Monish. And so I see his exchanges with other people. And Monish has this reputation, partly um, thanks to me for being slightly gruff and, and willing to be rude and willing to say to people, no, I'm, I, I'm not going to have lunch with this person ever again because I don't like, you, you know, I, I don't feel like this person is going to make me better. So I'm just not going to hang out with them again. And so there's something of, I write about this in the book. There's something about Monish. He's very true to himself. So if he thinks, as he puts it, if someone is a yo-yo, he's like, I'm not going to spend time with that person. And he doesn't like to do marketing um, of his funds. So he's like, no, I'm not wasting any of my time on, on the mumbo jumbo of marketing and meeting shareholders. I'll meet them once a year and that's it. And um, so, so he has this slightly gruff reputation. And what really struck me at that meeting at that dinner was how incredibly kind and gracious he was to everyone. Like incredibly kind. Like, like we were sitting next to a couple of really well-known young, uh, well, one well-known younger investor who I think may already be a billionaire is certainly on his way to being a billionaire. And I didn't know him. And Monish was just so generous to him. It was like, you know, William, you should really talk to this guy. He's, he's really extraordinary. He's far more impressive than I am. And this other guy who was totally unknown, who, who, is incredible who's managing you know he's, he's built like dozens of companies privately and monish is like you, you should talk to him he's just extraordinary and i saw monish's generosity and kindness to these people and i when when i did a podcast interview with monish for my podcast um i asked him about you know i asked him about some of how he's changed over the years and i i just see him becoming kinder and gentler and, and I, I sort of commented on it to him at one point. And he said, I, I feel like during that weekend in Omaha, there are all of these people who would love to talk to Warren and Charlie, and they don't get to. And I do get to. And if I can be of service to these people while they're in, in Omaha, I will be. And I thought that was an extraordinary thing that he had just decided, I'm going to be here this weekend just to be of service to others. And so there's a generosity of spirit to Monish in the way that he dealt with everyone in Omaha at that dinner, um, when people came up to him on the floor of the, the, the giant stadium where we were watching Warren and Charlie speak. And I find that very heartening when I see people change like that and soften and become gentler. I, I find that very inspiring. And I, I see that with Warren, Charlie, Monish, Guy Spear, I see them working on themselves. You know, you see Charlie becoming a gentler, kinder human as he gets older. And, and again, there's a really important takeaway for us here that you, you, you want to keep working on yourself. And when you see someone like Monish, become, you know, really applying this idea of truthfulness and service, you tuck that away and you say, okay, uh, let let me clone that. Yeah, I want to figure out how to learn to invest better. But let me also cl clone these qualities of how to operate. And so one thing that Monish decided early on, you know, he has this um, incredible foundation, Dakshana, in India. Monish just decided, we'll, we'll never pay a, uh, a bribe. We just won't. 
will never pay a bribe. I, I'd rather fold up my tent and go home than pay a bribe. That was a hard thing to decide in India, just as it would be in Bangladesh or many other emerging markets. I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful in any way. That was his decision, that he was just going to be truthful and honest. And if they didn't appreciate it, he would fold up his tent and go home. And what he's found is he's able to operate that way. And so I think sometimes just deciding that you're going to operate with these principles like truthfulness, integrity, kindness, generosity of spirit, sharing, serving others, people feel it and it draws different people into your life. And, and I, see it, I see it with Monish. I can see why Munga wants to hang out with Monish. And, and so this is a really important thing for the rest of us to, to, to clone, to decide who is it I want to emulate in my life? Do I want to emulate this snake who, who cheats everybody, who bribes everybody, who lies, who looks out for their own interests, who I can't trust? Or do I want to partner with somebody who's going to, who's going to look out for my interests and share with me and take care of their shareholders and treat their partners decently? And this is a really profound question. And when, when you look at your life and you decide what kind of life you want to lead and how you want to be remembered when, you know, your, your wife and kids are at your funeral, um, it's very clarifying. You start to think, which, which path do I want to take? And so those are, those are two insights into Monish, two stories about Monish that give you a sense of why, why I admire him and why, why I'm looking at these qualities that go beyond his ability to make money and thinking, yeah, that's what I want to clone. Well, thank you for sharing all these valuable insights with us, William. Um, but I'm, I'm going to throw the ball to Sabir right now to ask the next question. Thank you, Ran. William, I believe it was legendary investor Tom Gaynor, who started by running five minutes a day the first week and gradually increased the time he spent running each week. It seems that many of these highly successful investors were able to identify early on what they wanted to compound and improve their age in various areas gradually in a chaotic world. One of the examples of that is compounding goodwill. For the benefit of our young audience listening to this podcast, could you explain to us what compounded goodwill means to you and provide some practical ways that the younger generation can build this edge over others in navigating the world. Yeah, Guy Spear, I think, stole the idea from another friend of ours called Ken Schubenstein, who I also write about in my book, who's remarkable. Um, you, you know, as with all good ideas, you never really know where it came from. And one of the things Guy mentioned to me once is every time he figured something out, and had this great epiphany, he would then discover that Warren had figured it out 40 years earlier. And um, so, so, but the, the, the provenance of the idea of compounded goodwill for me comes from Guy. And Guy takes this idea very, very seriously. So, so many years ago, I, I've been friends with Guy for about 25 years uh, and invested in his fund for more than 20 years. So, and, and I helped him with, with his book. And I, I mean, I'm going to stay with him in, in Switzerland in a, later this month. So Guy is an old and dear friend. And so I'm, I'm, Bias, but I've also observed him very, very closely for many years. Um, I helped to edit his annual report as well. Um, and so Guy decided many years ago that you don't just want to be compounding money, that, that there are other things you can compound. And, and so he decides that he's going to start compounding acts of kindness. And one of the things that he would do, for example, he read somewhere that it was a really good idea to write thank you letters to people. And so Guy is kind of maniacal and obsessive. And when he takes, uh, when he finds an idea like this, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm just really going to do this. Same as Monish. Like Monish, Monish says, when you find a good idea, like cloning, you want to go a thousand percent. You don't want to dabble. You want to really take this to heart. And Guy, similarly, it's very obsessive, right? So Guy says, okay, I'm going to write three letters a day to people, thanking them for things. And so, so Guy initially starts with this idea that he's going to be compounding goodwill by thanking people, by sending them presents. He's always sending them chocolates and books and, and birthday cards and holiday cards and stuff. 
And he initially starts by thinking, well, I understand what Robert Cialdini, the author of books like um, Persuasion, has figured out, which is that there's there's this um, this whole um, behavioral psychology uh, understanding of, of what's called reciprocation. So if you're nice to someone, they're going to reciprocate. If you're generous with someone, they're going to reciprocate. And so Guy was like, well, so if I keep being nice to people and keep helping people, the world, everyone's going to have this sort of reciprocation tendency. And so it's going to benefit me in my profession. I'm going to become more successful, stuff like that. So it was slightly cynical when he first did it, at least the way he explains it. But at a certain point, he found that he became addicted to the feelings that he got from sharing with people that actually compounding goodwill made him feel happier. And so what I've observed over the years is this kind of this kind of purification of guys motive, where I see just how much joy he gets out of compounding goodwill out of being decent to people. And I've been the recipient of this so many times, I can't even tell you where guy just just does something out of the blue to introduce you to someone to sing your praises to someone. Um, uh, he, you know, I think at one point, he said to me, that whenever he accepted an invitation to be on a podcast, he would say, Yeah, but first, can you interview this friend of mine? And so he was always using it as a way to to put forward other people to help them. And so it's just a really lovely way to operate. And, and again, one of the things that Guy suspected early on was, well, what if what if everyone regards me as just a sucker and they take advantage because I'm just trying to compound goodwill and be kind? And he said that for a while there was a process where there were all of these takers who would just sort of come in and exploit. And then he said, you get pretty good at sorting out who are the givers and who are the takers. I've never really found that. I tend to find that if you're trying to be kind and decent to the world, um, you tend to attract back a lot of kindness and decency. And it's just, it's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary social, moral, intellectual experiment to decide let me just be there pumping out good stuff into the world, trying to treat people kindly. Let me make that a central motive in my life. And then just sit back and watch and see what happens. And I just think it's kind of miraculous. Like you just, wherever you go, you find people who want to help Guy. And I see the same thing with Tom Gaynor, the, the CEO of Markel, who you mentioned before. Incredibly kind, incredibly decent person. So many people want to help. Tom, and I'll, I'll give you a quick example of this that I, 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 I think, well, I'll give you a couple with Tom. Okay, so here's, here's a guy who is CEO of a Fortune 400 company, right? So he's probably got 20,000 employees, um, manages about $20 billion. This is a pretty busy guy. He would do things like he would see a video of my kids, Henry and Madeline, playing a John Prine song together, singing together, um, this beautiful song by this uh, um, country musician, John Prine, who had died. And it was during Hanukkah, this holiday. And so there, there's this candelabra, this beautiful candelabra, and there are like these eight or nine candles glowing. And you got my daughter who's 21, but was probably a couple of years younger then. And my son who's 24, who was a couple of years younger then. And they're playing together. And they kind of got beautiful voices and my son plays guitar really beautifully and they kind of love each other. And there's something sort of magical about it. And they're playing this song by John Prine. It's kind of beautiful and melancholy. And my daughter doesn't really know the song, but is kind of making it up as she goes along and makes some mistakes, but there's something really beautiful and touching. Tom Gaynor writes to me and says how touched he is by this performance that he's seen on Facebook. And then, you know, then another extraordinary investor, a guy called Sarab Madan, who you've probably seen because he, he used to host all of the talks at Google. He, he wrote to me and said, oh, yeah, I saw the video of your kids performing because Tom uh, showed it to me. And then I was, I was emailing Tom about something else recently. And Tom's like, every time I think of you, I think of that video of your kids performing. Here's a for Fortune 400 company CEO 
bothering to take the time to tell me how much he loves something that my kids have done. And then again, I did an event last year, a, a private event for a company where I'm an investment advisor in New York. And I, I needed to interview a famous investor. And it's like, what's in it for a famous investor to come to New York to be interviewed privately? And he takes a train for six hours from his home in Virginia to New York so that I could interview him at a fireside, do a fireside chat interview with him at this private event. And then he didn't even stay for the other talks by these extraordinary people. He didn't have time. So he just took a train for six hours back to Virginia to get on with his job. So he just did that out of pure kindness. So when you see someone like that behaving in a sort of selfless, kind, decent way, you never really forget it. And I, I don't know, there's, there's something, I, I think I write about this in the ep epilogue. No, yeah, maybe the epilogue of my book about Arnold Vandenberg, an extraordinary human being. And someone did something for him when he was very young. He was a very broken young man. He survived the Holocaust. And, and he was selling some flowers on the street um, in California. And there was just torrential rain, like he, a biblical rainstorm. And he's drenched and he can't believe his bad luck. It's like the first time he's had the great corner on that street to sell these flowers. And this woman pulls up in her car and says, how much are the flowers? And he's like, well, these are this much and these are this much. And the woman's like, no, no, for all of them. And she buys all of them so that he'll get out of the rain and then drives him to her home and gives him one of her husband's shirts. And, and he said to me, when someone does something like that to you, it touches your heart and you never forget. And it changed him forever. I mean, he's now in his eighties and he does acts of kindness where he'll tell the person, this thing happened to me when I was a teenager, you know, 65 years ago. And so these acts of, these acts of goodwill, these acts of kindness, these acts of selflessness, they kind of reverberate around the world. And so you, you, start, you start them maybe with selfish understanding of, yeah, other people will like me more and they'll want to do business with me and my career will get better. And then at a certain point, when you see people like Monish or Guy or Tom Gaynor or, or Arnold Vandenberg acting this way, you start to think that, that, that I want more of that. I want to be with these people. You know, I, I, I haven't even thanked him. You know, I got a, I got a, uh, a, a big box of nuts and fruits and stuff from Arnold Vandenberg last, last week for Christmas and New Year. Nothing in it for him to do that. He, he sent me a trampoline a few years ago because he thought I was too lazy. And, and needed a trampoline, nothing in it for him to do that. He's probably sent me 20 books over the years. So this again, I, I'm sorry that I'm taking so much time that you're probably not gonna get to all of your questions, but this is such an important lesson. Like when you see these people who are very successful, they're on top of the world and you start to realize these are some of the smartest people alive. Why are they acting this way? It's, it's rational and it's pragmatic, but it, you know, Tom Gaynor once said to me, I'd behave that way, even if there wasn't a benefit, you know, it's, it's just the right way to behave. And there's something really beautiful about it when you see it. And so I, I hope for our listeners, like you just, you just look at, you look at the people in your life who inspire you like that. And you just say, let me try to be a bit more like that. I, I interviewed someone last week, this guy, Fred Martin, who's 76, right? And there's certain qualities that he has that are kind of extraordinary. And I look at it and I'm like, okay, he's at this phase of his life where he's just a teacher. He's just trying to share important lessons. What do I need to learn from this guy? What, how do I, how do I need to become more like this guy? And he's going through such difficulties. He's having so much, you know, like a sick wife, he lost his son. He's, you know, he's really having difficulties and he's talking about how, how you need to relish the good times. And he's, he's sort of saying, look, my, my wife has, has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it's really hard, but he's like, I've got to focus on the days that are good with her. There are days where it's good. And, you know, when you, when you hear these, these really smart, really successful people explaining how life works and you hear a lesson like that, whether it's about compounding goodwill or resilience or cloning 
or sharing, you won't really take it to heart. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a beautiful line um, from Charlie Munger where he says, take a simple idea and take it seriously. So when you hear some of these things, if, if any of these ideas resonate, if you decide, okay, yeah, compounding, goodwill, let me, let me try that or um, relish the good times because difficult stuff happens. There's no avoiding it. It's going to happen or um, cloning, you know, reverse engineer people who know stuff that you haven't figured out and then really replicate it with great attention to detail. All of these things, when, when, you, when you come across a good idea like that, that resonates with you, that, that sort of fits with your, your personality and your soul, take it seriously, you know, really, really go full bore on it. Sorry, and there, there I'll stop and let you get on with your next question. No, I, I mean, thank you, William, for sharing your perspective and expanding upon the concept of uh, compounding goodwill. Uh, Sabir, why don't we go to the next question? Sure. Uh, William, let me change the topic a little bit. I would like to focus on belly one dancing. of your core... In <laughs> we're we're going to talk about belly dancing now. Okay, yeah, we want sorry. To, we want to see your belly dancing, not... We want to hear about Any it, but now. after we watch it. <laughs> yeah. If, if this were an audio-only interview, I would show you my belly dancing. <laughs> okay. As, as we don't get to see belly dancing, let me focus on one of your core interests, William. <laughs> Mysticism and Buddhism. You have delved deeply yeah. into these topics. And with, as with all things you do, you have gone a thousand miles deep in your quest for understanding things. Could you share what motivated you to pursue this path and what have been your most significant insights gained while exploring the meaning of life? Oh. Hi. Uh, it's a big question. I, I was like, I should try to answer one question <laughs> briefly instead, instead of doing these half hour Sorry, monologues. That. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm going to tell you the meaning well, of life. Well, William, process. please take your time. Please take your time. We're thoroughly okay. enjoying it. And I'm um, pretty sure it's going to be very helpful for all the audience. Please thanks. take your time. So, so I have studied a lot of Buddhism. I'm no great expert by any means. I wouldn't want to overstate my knowledge of this. And I, I'm not just being modest here. <laughs> like, like there are a lot of people who know a lot more about this than I do. Um, I've studied a lot of Kabbalah as well, which is this ancient form of mysticism that I've also found unbelievably helpful. And so I would say those two things, combined with a deep study of um, David Hawkins' books, which were um, things like Power Versus Force, but also lots of his other books like Letting Go. Um, those three channels um, or areas of exploration have been incredibly helpful to me. And they're all pretty similar and uh, in different ways. Some of the, the conclusions are pretty similar in different ways. Um, within the world of Buddhism, there's a particular lineage of great um, meditation masters that I study that I found incredibly helpful. Um, there's, a, there's a guy called Sokni Rinpoche, and Sokni is spelled T-S-O-K-N-Y-I. And Rinpoche is a term meaning precious one that's used to describe these very elevated lamas, these sort of reincarnated gurus who are just very, very precious, special people. And I do think he's a precious and special person. He's a remarkable teacher. And his father was, uh, and his father's father was, and going back something like a thousand years, this lineage has been extraordinary. And one of the things that I'm doing at the moment is there's a there's a course online called Fully Being that Sokni taught, and I'm 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 going through it at the moment. I you can subscribe or you can test it for free for a, a week or two, but I I bought it a couple of years ago, uh, uh, um, which means you can sort of use it forever. Um, it's not, not expensive, but I'm going through one unit a day. And some of these are just sort of two or three minutes, sometimes it's seven minutes, sometimes it's eight minutes. Um, and so at the moment, for example, I'm going through this section that's about um, what he calls lung, which is a Tibetan term for this kind of speedy energy in the body. And so it's this energy that's kind of going sort of in your head where you're like, oh my God, I've got to be here and I've got to do this and I've got to juggle this and that. And he's talking about how to deal with this um, 
imbalanced energy so that you can become calmer, more balanced, more clear headed. And so, for example, I, I mean, I had him on my on my podcast recently, which is the only the only um, enlightened being in saffron robes that you're ever likely to see on an investment podcast. Um, and, uh, you know, he talks about how to do this type of belly breathing, where basically, you know, you 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 exhale your belly a little bit like a balloon and then you hold me for five seconds, seven seconds, something like that. You hold your breath and then you, without forcing it, and then you breathe back in and you're sort of focusing on moving the energy down from here to your belly. And so this is one of the things that I've been doing the last week or two, just playing with to try to settle myself, to move the energy down. So, because I tend to be all in my head, I'm always thinking, it's like my mind is racing and, you know, I'm juggling too many things. And so I'm thinking, well, if I can calm myself, that'll help me with my meditation. It'll help me with my work. It'll help me to be more present for other people when I'm talking to them. And so that's a very practical example of one of the things that you're able to get from studying Buddhism is this idea of how to be more balanced in terms of your thoughts and your emotions so that um, within the chaos and the maelstrom of life, you're able to operate. And, and so this morning, I mean, right before I came um, to see you, you know, it's, it's 11 in the morning here in, in New York. It's much later for you in, in Bangladesh. My wife was on the phone with a family member who's in hospital and who's really confused and who's really upset and, um, and kind of falling apart. And this is someone I love and have known for over 30 years. And you're listening, you're listening to this guy just falling apart. And he's someone who's a really wonderful human being and has helped thousands of people over the years. And, you know, you're, you're listening to that and you're like, how can I help my wife? How can I be there for her? How can I keep calm and not be overwhelmed by this so I can come and then talk to you? And I think that's a sort of, that's a microcosm of what's happening to us all the time in life. We're being bombarded by um, other people's pain, by um, poverty, by stress, by uh, images of war, um, COVID. There's a lot going on and you're being buffeted the whole time. And so one of the things that, that I'm trying to do by studying things like Buddhism and Kabbalah is to try to be a little more calm and balanced within the storm. And so one of, one of the things that Sokni Rinpoche says that I love is he talks about um, sitting within the fluidity without judging. And so there's this fluidity going on all around you, right? Like you're sitting there, whether you're meditating formally or you're just sitting here as we're talking and like there's something going on, you know, I see you Ryan, like your, your forehead is, you know, like this and your eyebrows are arched and you're intensely concentrating. You're probably thinking of your next question and you're thinking what we're saying. And you're thinking like, are we going to end soon? Do we have enough time? Is he taking too long? Do, you know, uh, is this okay? You know, it's like your mind is working and you're thinking, how do I apply this to my own life? And what about this relative? You know, like our minds, if we're alive and thoughtful and intelligent people, they're just like, it's like, um, you know, it's like a snow globe where you shake it up and there's all this stuff going on in there, right? And then we've got deadlines and we've got work and we've got family and we're juggling all of this stuff. And so there's all of this fluidity. And so, you know, you don't just want to be yanked around by all of that stuff that's going on, the news, the events, the stuff in your family, the stuff with friends, the things you see on the street. Um, you know, you, want, you don't want to cut yourself off from it, but you need somehow to be calm at the eye of the storm, somehow to sit calmly within the fluidity with a kind of clarity and compassion, kindness, emotional balance. And, and so how do you do that? And so meditation is one of the most powerful methods of doing it. And Sokni Rinpoche is one of the great masters of meditation. And so I, I think he's worth studying. Um, but I think you can get to this you know, with Vipassana or any, any of these other things. But I, maybe, maybe part of the thing is that the Tibetans have suffered a great deal, right? So Sokne, Sokne's father had to flee from Tibet. They were, you know, oppressed by the Chinese. Um, 
And I, I'm not trying to be political here, uh, you know, but they've dealt with a lot of suffering. It's, it's like my ancestors, I'm Jewish, you know, like my ancestors had to flee from Russia and Poland and Ukraine. And, um, and so maybe we had to deal with a lot of pain and suffering. And so we had to figure out how do you deal with hardship? How do you deal with adversity in practical terms? And so, you know, so, so Kabbalah, which is a sort of ancient form of Jewish wisdom, um, that's now available to people from all faiths and, and Buddhism, which is also, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, which is also an ancient form of uh, wisdom that I guess came from India and elsewhere, um, is now also available to all of us. And so I think what you want to do is at least say, I know this is important for me to gain control of my inner landscape. I, I know that this is a priority because the the whirlwind is not going to stop, right? There's still, there's always going to be pain and suffering. There are going to be wars. There are going to be natural disasters. There are going to, you know, we're all going to get old. And I was thinking about, you know, this relative of mine who's, you know, losing it in hospital and so panicked and so upset. And I could hear him sounding confused and frightened and irrational. And, and this is a brilliant, brilliant man. And, um, a lovely man. And, you know, and I was sort of thinking, God, I wish he had the tools, you know, to gain peace of mind. You know, I wish he meditated all of these years. I wish, I wish he had faith, um, you know, it would really help. And so I think knowing that this is a priority, that peace of mind is a priority is really critical. And then thinking, what am I going to do to nurture that peace of mind? How will I get there? And so maybe it's prayer, maybe it's meditation, maybe it's exercise, maybe it's walking in nature, maybe it's volunteering somewhere to help other people. You know, at a time when everyone is so stressed and so there's so much suffering and so much pain, you want to try to be, you know, this somewhat balanced giving, sharing, calming presence at the heart of the storm. Um, how are you going to do that? And so, so I think it helps to have a few fundamental principles that you understand that you live by, um, that you can get from any faith, whether it's, uh, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, doesn't, doesn't, you know, the Stoics were very powerful thinkers, right? The Stoics would, would focus on what you can control and distinguishing that from what you can't control. So, so you can't control the external circumstances, but you can control your own state of mind and your own integrity and your own intention. And so um, just knowing that you can take control of your own mind is a very powerful thing. And, and so all of these technologies, these spiritual technologies, whether it's prayer or meditation, uh, I think they're all ways of gaining control of your mind, of your inner landscape. Um, you know, praying, praying for others, right? It's a way of getting yourself out of your own narcissism and selfishness so that you're thinking about other people. So, I mean, it sounds kind of ridiculous, but you know, while my wife was on the phone this morning doing that, I'm, I was like, no, I'll go do my morning, my morning prayers where, you know, part of what I'm doing is I'm, um, um, you know, hoping for peace of mind for that person. Well, you know, does it do him any good? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I hope so. It does me some good to be, to be sending him goodwill, you know, but, but know, know that these things, that this, this battle to gain control over your inner life battle is maybe the wrong word, you know, because it's sort of, it's negative. Uh, it has negative connotations. This, this, um, this mission of gaining control of your inner landscape is, is hugely important because if, if you're not calm within the storm, um, or working towards getting calm, um, how are you going to help other people? How are you going to be there for your kids, for your parents, for your, your spouse, for, for your friends, for your partner? And, and so I, I think it's, um, it's, it's not a surprise that a lot of the greater investors meditate because it helps them to to be calm when they invest which is important but the benefits for you as a parent or as a spouse uh, or as a friend are huge as well because you know when i see when i see my own behavior i'm at my worst when i'm stressed 
right? So yesterday, my, my, my wife is dealing with this health emergency for this family member. And, you know, she's moved into the room underneath my room. And so I can hear every word. And these people she's helping, they're kind of deaf. And so she's shouting down the phone. And I'm trying to write something. I'm getting more and more frustrated and annoyed by this. And it's like my poor wife is dealing with this, you know, this family crisis. And I'm sitting there sort of, sort of like, I can't believe she's making so much noise. And so if I can, if I can do something that's going to calm me, I'm less likely to snap at her and make her cry than, uh, you know, so, it, so if I can just keep calm and be like, well, of course she's going through difficult stuff. And of course she has to speak loudly because these people are deaf. And no, knowing that this is vitally important and that you have to do something to make yourself calm, um, you know, all, all of us are buffeted at times and can't actually handle it. Like all of us sometimes are, are going to be just too stressed, too upset. Um, uh, but even to have the self-awareness to see that, 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 energy buzzing and be like, you, you know, be like, um, God, I'm struggling. Let me, let me be a little careful here. Let me try to be a bit more sensitive. Let me try to breathe a little, a little slowly, um, so that I get myself under control. So, so one of the great things about meditation is just have that self-awareness. So, so you know what state you're in. And so you can say, maybe this is not the best time to bring up a topic with my wife because I'm not going to behave well. Well, William, you know, all of these are gems and thank you so much for, uh, you know, sharing these with us today. Uh, uh, totally my know, pleasure. Uh, if you, if you want to ask one last question, I know, I, I, I know I go on too long and I said to you, uh, you know, we should try to be done by 1130, but if there's one, if there's one other burning question, you think, God, I wish I could ask that. Uh, I, I'm happy. I'm happy to do it. I don't want to, I, or you might be thinking, God, I wish this would end and this guy would shut up. <laughs> In which case you well, can say no more questions. Oh, well, William, well, we have prepared lots of, lots of questions and, uh, you know, would obviously like to, uh, you know, ask, uh, all of them, maybe, maybe some other day. Uh, but, uh, I, I really do not want to, uh, you know, upset a lot of people who have sent us the question and one common question, uh, from them was, uh, you know, could you, could you mention a book name that has had a tremendous impact on you, uh, but does not get mentioned or isn't mainstream or famous? Sure. I mean, I mean, look, if I look on my desk here, I have, I have two books right next to me, right? So I have this book, which I try to read every single day, which is the Zohar, which is Zohar is a Hebrew or Aramaic word meaning splendor. And so it's the book of splendor and it's a very mystifying book. It's almost impossible to understand. And it's in, I have a version that's in 23 volumes. Um, and it's translated by a teacher of mine, a remarkable guy called Michael Berg. And I, I'm not trying in any way to be a proselytizer for this particular book. I think, I think in any faith, in any path, it's very helpful to find one book that you can keep coming back to again and again. And so, you know, I try to I try to dip into this every day. And one of the things that I do is um, I play what I call Zohar roulette. And so I open it randomly every day and I think, OK, so there's a message. So I'll, I'll show you what I do. So I literally I would go, OK, so this is this is um, it's probably my favorite part of the Zohar. So, so it's a, partly a portion called Miketz. So I'd open this. OK, so it's come to a different portion. And so I would look and it would say. So it's talking about the evil inclination, our ego, right? Our, um, and it says, because the evil inclination constantly accuses him, it behooves a man to overcome, man or woman, obviously, to overcome it and stand firmly so that the evil inclination cannot move him. Man must be mightier than it and be attached to the place of gavura, might, strength. For when man overpowers it, he cleaves to the side of, of gavura, of might, and is strengthened. Because the evil inclination is mighty, it behooves a man to be mightier. Those who overcome it are described as mighty in strength. Um, these are the angels of the Holy One, blessed be he, namely the righteous. Uh, and so, and then it says, uh, bless, bless Hashem, bless the creator, you angels of his, such as Joseph, who was called righteous and mighty 
and preserve the holy covenant which was imprinted upon him. So I look at that and I'm like, it sounds pretty mystifying, but I'm like, okay, so I have my evil inclination, right? My ego, my desire to just do stuff for my own satisfaction, whether it's, you know, taking advantage of other people, or maybe it's like lust or, you know, or anger or whatever. And it's saying to me, yeah, the, the evil inclination constantly accuses you. It's constantly out to get you. You know, we all have it. And so the question is, can you stand firmly and be mightier than this force? And then it's saying to you, there are these figures like Joseph, the righteous, he was called, who was mighty in overcoming his evil inclination. And there's a great story in the Old Testament where it says, you know, that um, Potiphar, Pharaoh's wife, wanted to sleep with Joseph, and Joseph didn't sleep with her. And um, as a result, he gets accused by Potiphar's wife of rape and is thrown in a dungeon for something like 12 years. And one of the commentaries on the Old Testament says he wanted to sleep with her. And that's really interesting that it's saying to you, here's this righteous figure. And it's not like he was so holy that he didn't want to sleep with Pharaoh's wife. He wanted to sleep with her but he didn't, he overcame it. And that's the moment when he became Joseph the righteous, not just Joseph, right? Because he overcame his, uh, his, his evil inclination, his desire to just look out for himself, to give into his, his ego. So, so I'm, I'm looking at the Zohar kind of randomly, and I'm not saying you should all read the Zohar. Obviously I think it's an amazing, amazing and mystifying and beautiful book, but, um, you know, in your own faith, in your own path, to look at these things that sort of resonate really deeply. And just to look and be like, how does that apply to me? And so I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, okay, so, so all of us have like our evil inclination, our desire to do things that are not great for other people. Um, that's, that's part of the game. It's baked in from the beginning. It's not like some people are totally holy and other people are totally impure. It's, it's saying to you, even even Joseph um, had this desire, and yet he was mighty enough to overcome it. And so in the same way that I was saying before, you know, when you see people like, like Monish or Munga or Guy or Arnold Vandenberg becoming better people, it's very inspiring. They're, they're becoming mightier. And I'm not trying to idealize them because they all have flaws. I mean, there's one thing, you know, they're, they're, they're not holier and more righteous than we are. They're flawed human beings who mess up and do stupid things and have their own flaws and their own struggles and their own issues and their own moments of stress or blind spots or selfishness, but they're working on themselves. And, and so I think you, you know, so this is just a sort of meditation that I'm getting a message that I'm getting just from, just from randomly opening a book of the Zohar this morning. That's making me think, okay, so, so let me, let me try to stand firm against my own negative inclination. And, and every time I fall and I struggle and I mess up and I'm not so kind or not so honest or not so good at controlling my, uh, my, my lust or whatever it is, or my greed for more donuts and toast or whatever, instead of, instead of looking at myself and being like, you are such a worm and look at all of these people who are so righteous and so pure. They're not like you. You're just a schmuck. It's like, no, they, they, they have their temptation as well. They have their difficulties as well. They have their struggles. And so there's a, there's a lovely line from this, um, this, uh, Buddhist meditation teacher called Sharon Salzberg who's a great meditation teacher here in the U S who, who says, um, um, let go and begin again with self-compassion. And this for me has been one of the most helpful things I've learned in recent years is every time I mess up, it's not, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's like, yep, yeah, I screwed up again because I'm human and I'm flawed, but let go and begin again with self-compassion. And, and so, yes, we want to try to be mighty and stand firm in opposing the parts of ourselves that are less noble and elevated, but we also need to have self-compassion and know, yeah, we're pretty flawed. We're pretty human. And so is everyone else. And that's, uh, and, and, and let, let me start again. Let me not get so down on myself because I see 
so much of my own garbage and nonsense and selfishness. Let me not get so down on myself that then I become paralyzed. And instead of be like, yep, okay, let me try to learn the lesson. I screwed up in that way again. But, uh, you know, one, one thing Sharon Sol Solzberg would say is, all is not lost, right? So all is not lost. Let go, begin again with self-compassion. I hope that's helpful. Well, uh, William, as much as we would like to continue this conversation, we also don't want to be disrespectful to the time you have allowed to us. And thank you so much, William, for extending the time. And uh, we appreciate that you're taking all these questions uh, from us. Uh, now, it's, well, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. And they're, they're great uh, questions. And, and uh, you know, maybe next year we'll get to the other questions and you can add some new ones. And so, uh, so yeah, we, we can schedule it. So, January 2024, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll do it again. That'd be fantastic, uh, William, wow. let's do that. <laughs> William, uh, now why don't you uh, share where people can follow your writings and works and find out more about you? Sure, I, I have a website that I fail consistently to update, um, but have been meaning to update for at least a year now, which is called williamgreenwrites.com. And it has various uh, old articles of mine, things like that. Um, I have a, a podcast, uh, which is called Richer, Wiser, Happier. I've had some really amazing guests and, and the conversations are long and in-depth and often deep. And you have some of the, the, great, the greatest investors talking about what they've learned, not only about investing, but about life. And so there's, if you look up um, Richer, Wiser, Happier podcast, um, you can find a website of mine that has, I think it's mine, maybe it's not, that has, that has all of the <laughs> old episodes. You can also look on, um, there's a thing called We Study Billionaires, which is a very, very popular investing podcast. And, and luckily, thanks to my friends um, who, who run the Investors Podcast Network, um, my podcast goes out on the feed of We Study Billionaires, which makes it a little confusing because it's harder to find. But if you subscribe to We Study Billionaires, which you should anyway, because I have great guests, um, you'll, you'll find the Rich or Wise Happier podcast. And there's a lot going into that podcast. It's, it's very rich. I, I'm not trying to say this as a sort of shill and salesman. I, I just think there's a lot to learn from these conversations. And then, um, and then there's Rich or Wise Happier itself, the book, which I, I, hope, I hope people will look at because I put... Um, again, I'm not trying to be a salesman, but it's, I'm trying to distill 25 years of learning from the greatest investment minds to, to share with you guys and, 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 and to learn this stuff myself and to share it with you. And, and so there's a lot in there. And if you find an idea from one of these great investors that resonates with you, I would just say, go big on it. Really, really take it to heart. So there's a sort of buffet of very, very rich ideas from these people because they're such extraordinary thinkers. But if you find a few things that really resonate, don't just dabble, like, like actually take it to heart. Um, and then, you know, feel free to follow me on Twitter, uh, William Green 72, or, you know, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or whatever. I, I, I'm pretty responsive when people write to me on Twitter and LinkedIn, but at the same time, I'm finding the complexity of my life is sort of, uh, increasing and and i sometimes get these really beautiful messages from people and then fail entirely to write to them and and uh and i'm expressing my guilt and um uh embarrassment to the universe um but i i do i do try to get back to people but it's often hard um but i i yeah i hope this stuff helps you and i hope it um i hope it leads leads your listeners in a good direction oh it will surely do william and Thank you all for joining us today. This show is sponsored by Air Capital. For more details and updates, please visit www.ar.capital. I'd also like to announce that our pre-launch annual report is out for your weekend reading. The links will be provided in the description box below. If you like today's episode, then hit like, subscribe, and press the bell icon. And don't forget to share the video with your friends. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. William, we can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Uh, and thank you. We've it's got been to a real again. Thank you so much, I William. I look forward to it. Until thank the next you very time, much. William. All right. Take care. Stay well. Take care.